All right, welcome to technical session number 24, everybody's favorite. We're going to be talking about printers, such an amazing world with lots of variety and tons of things to learn. And it is absolutely everybody's favorite subject. We all love printers. So we're going to dive into that a little bit today. We're going to be talking about the different types of printers we need to be aware of. They kind of fall into a few different families. We're going to be talking about troubleshooting these printers, what kind of possible problems could come up. We're going to talk about, you know, we did mention earlier the King method for computer repair. Today, we're going to talk about the Philbin method of printer repair. Almost as good. But it only works for dot matrix printers. Today, we're going to be able to, we're going to talk about and compare and contrast different types of printers. Identify common steps for installing printers, identify common pitfalls with installing printers, and identify common problems that come up with the printers and describe how to solve them. We're also going to dive into that a little bit more this afternoon when we get into hardware network troubleshooting. We get into more printer troubleshooting with that. We also get into obviously monitors um, and other hardware aspects as well, power supplies, CPUs, things like that. For this particular technical session, we want to keep in mind our behavior skills and mindsets, communication. We want to be able to effectively communicate with not only our teammates, but our customers, as well as our managers. And of course, most importantly, personal responsibility. No matter how much we dislike printers, how much we don't want to learn about it, we got to go through the process. So there are four major categories or families or groups of printers that we tend to talk about throughout the course of this program. You have your old school impact printers, which, you know, its name comes directly from the fact that it actually is making physical contact with the page. There is an actual impact from the printer itself to transfer the ink from a ribbon onto the page. And then you have your ink jets, which tend to be the most common ones in personal use <clears throat> because of the low cost for entry into that particular technology. Although many of you are out there going, why does the printer cost 20 bucks and the ink cartridge cost me $80? Well, we're going to talk about that today. Then we get into thermal printers, which if you're printing shipping labels, if you're printing uh, receipts, stuff like that, these are hands down the most efficient way to do those kind of things. They're extremely fast, low maintenance, and... There's not a lot that can go wrong with them. They actually yes. function pretty well uh, with minimal intervention. Can't play this one. What? What? All right, and then lastly, we have a laser printers, which is hands down the most complex of all the ones we are going to be working with. And um, uh, so they're the most complex. We have to understand the process that goes through with laser printers. They have, unfortunately, the most things that can go wrong with them. They're also the most dangerous for us as technicians. So we need to be aware of that. So we will be talking about the process of laser printing. There are seven steps. We have to know these steps and what each one of these steps does, but don't worry. We have not one, but two mnemonics for you <clears throat> so that you can remember those steps. We have a G rated version and we have an R rated version. I'll give you both depending on your uh, preference. You can pick whichever one you want, but unfortunately I've yet to find somebody who can remember the G rated version. I don't know why I'm not making, I'm not judging. But, you know, that's just the way it seems to fall. So. Let's talk about our four families of printers here. So first, the impact printer, as the name states, as we just talked about, it's there is a physical impact happening. 
there is something that is creating a you know that is striking an ink ribbon that is transferring that image onto the paper. The best known one that people tend to remember is the dot matrix. It's the one that made like the screeching sound as the head rolled back and forth across the printer. You had the sheets of paper that had the little holes on the side that were slowly fed through the printer itself. And um, very, very common, still heavily in use today in certain circumstances. And what it has is a series of little pistons inside there or pins or dots that will you know, impact this ribbon as the head moves across, creating those uh, sometimes images, they were very rudimentary images, but images and letters and stuff across the page. So the pins shoot out, impact that cloth ribbon, deposits the ink. They're extremely slow and extremely noisy, but they do have some advantages. They have a continuous feed of paper, like entire reams you could set in there. So it has on a continual track. So it is great for tractor fed and allows for large amounts of data logging. So you'll still see them sometimes in the medical field, rarely, but they are there. More often than not, you see them in manufacturing and auto bodies, like auto shops because they are less susceptible to debris, damage, stuff like that. They're much more durable than the other families of printers. They're, they're much more conducive to these types of environments like warehousing, manufacturing, mechanics, stuff like that. Also, they are known for something very, very specific and that is multi-part forms. You need to remember that multi-part forms you remember the carbon copies you know we have like three or four pages you know put it over there so like whenever they would print out a contract whenever you go to get your oil changed or you go to an auto shop or something like that they make you sign it they tear off one copy for themselves and they give one to you it requires an impact printer in order to create that multi-part form they're kind of transitioning away from that now making you sign it electronically then they print multiple copies but for the most part, still, still out there, a lot of you know, a lot of these places, multi-part forms. It requires an impact printer to transfer that image through the carbon paper to the other uh, pieces of paper. There you go. So slow, loud, but durable, and can do multi-part forms. Here's a basic look at what a impact printer looks like with its components. You know, you got your power switch, your sheet guide here that you would feed over the back, access cover tray, print head assembly is on a carriage that rides back and forth and it has an upper cover. There's some other details that we will get into, but just basic parts that we want to be aware of. There's another type of impact printer uh, that is called a uh, daisy wheel, which kind of looks like old typewriters. It's like it has all the, uh, the characters on a wheel that spin around like this, and then a piston will hit those characters as they come up with what they need, kind of like a typewriter. That's called a daisy wheel. So that is another type of impact printer you'll see other than a dot matrix. They also have one that is kind of like the daisy wheel where all the characters are on a ball and the ball is kind of like a hammer where the ball spins around and just keeps striking the page as the ball is spinning around with like all your numbers and letters all over the ball. So the two types of impact printers they want you to know about though are the dot matrix and the daisy wheel. Questions so far? All right. On to the inkjet. Most people's first printer they ever purchase is an inkjet, especially for your house 
usually it's like, you know, for school or taxes or whatever reason, this tends to be the first printer you buy because it is very inexpensive to get into. And it is kind of signified by certain features. It utilizes a print head uh, connected to a carriage that will slide back and forth and the carriage itself contains the ink. So the print head, all that technology, it shuttles back and forth on that carriage. There is a belt motor that moves the carriage back and forth over the whole page. And what it does is it sprays iodized ink onto the paper to form images using a matrix of small dots. And then as the print head moves across the paper, it creates a line of text or parts of the image, or whichever. The ink is stored in special small containers called ink cartridges, which is the majority of the cost of a printer resides in that cartridge. Also, the majority of the technology in the printer resides in that ink cartridge. Subtracting the ink cartridge from that printer, the printer itself is an extremely simple device. The print resolution on an inkjet printer is measured in DPI or dots per inch. The more dots you can fit in a particular inch, the you know, higher the resolution of the image you can create. The speed at which a printer can print is called PPM or pages per minute. So pretty straightforward. Dots per inch lets you know how clear the image is going to be. Pages per minute, how fast it can print. Some printers as they have evolved, most printers can at this point, they allow for duplex assemblies, which all that is is just a fancy term for saying it can print on both sides of the piece of paper. So you have duplex. Definitely want to remember that term. Duplex prints on both sides of the page. So you'll see it, it'll print out once, then it would suck the page back in, flip it around, print it back out the other side, and you have both sides of that page printed allowing you to save paper, but use just as much ink. And they have relatively good quality and it is reasonably fast printing. I've never been overly fond of the like photographs and stuff that they do on the, on the ink jets, but the color always seems way off to me rather than standard photography. But for quick photos and stuff like that, or pictures, it does really good. Yes, Susan, the majority of the technology with regards to an inkjet, it resides in the actual print head. They actually have chips attached to them. You know, it is a pressurized ink. There is um, a lot of stuff going on in the ink cartridge, which we'll talk about, which is why the ink cartridges are so expensive. That's not to say they don't have a hefty markup on them. It's just why they're more expensive than the printer itself because the actual technology in the printer is basically just a box, with a little carriage and a belt that goes back and forth, that's all. So everything, all the magic is happening inside that cartridge. And with the ink jet, you can produce black and white images. So they have printers that were just straight up black and white, or you can actually create the color images. Here are some of the components we need to be aware of. Uh, you have the ribbon cable, which will go from our, con our control circuitry, which is essentially our brain for our printer. And we have a control ribbon that will go to the carriage where your ink jet, your ink cartridges will sit. And um, you have a stepper motor that controls the belt that shuttles that carriage back and forth across. And then you have your paper feeds at the bottom to put things out. Now, over here kind of explains inside the print head what exactly is going on. How does it get that print, that ink 
to push out at the right moments. It's utilizing copper uh, wire or heating element that is gonna essentially heat that ink up really quickly and create a bubble inside the tube. And the bubble, as it expands, creates pressure forcing a, you know, a single speck of ink to be pushed out the end of that uh, tube. It's doing this hundreds or thousands of times per second. So it is a controlled dispersal utilizing this heating element to just, there's a little bubble of air and it just keeps, you know, as you heat something, it expands, it keeps expanding that bubble, forcing a little speck of ink out each time. And it's doing that in unison with each of the other cartridges, overlaying these dots to create the variety of colors that we see on the page. So all of this is happening inside that ink cartridge. Questions, comments, concerns. They also have breakdowns of this diagram inside your book as well on the chapter on printers. I highly recommend reading that, especially, especially become familiar with the troubleshooting segments. If there is any section in this book that you reread multiple times, it will be the troubleshooting chapters. I'm not gonna say the questions that they give you come directly from there. They don't repeat, but they do rhyme, if you know what I'm saying. It's like the old saying, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. So just a recommendation there. Thermal printers. Pretty simple devices for the most part mechanically. They use heat to create an image onto the paper. You need specialized paper in order to run it in a thermal printer. It burns dots into a special coated thermal paper often used for receipt papers. Does anybody know what happens if you, if middle of summer, you accidentally leave a receipt in your car, what happens? Anybody ever done this? It burns. Getting hot. Like fades out where you can't even see it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all, it, you know, wipes the image clean. This always bugs me because over time, thermal, you know, thermal receipts kind of fade. And so they'll, they'll give, you know, when you buy an expensive, I'm like, yeah, be sure to hold on to your receipt. Like, you know, you won't be able to read it in a year. <laughs> so be sure to scan your receipt because if you have the actual physical one, it's not, it's going to be useless to you. <clears throat> so, it fades out, but what turns it like a, like a brown color? If it gets extreme heat, it'll do that. Mm -hmm. You know, or well, ex extreme temperatures. Like I had it happen with, um, like uh, sunscreen. I, I I had a bottle of the spray sunscreen in my um, center console, and when I closed it hard one time, it pressed the lid on the sunscreen, so it started spraying, and it sprayed my receipts, and almost like, you know, because it has that compressed air, which is extremely cold, and it almost burned it. <laughs> so I've had that happen before. So, but. So the thermal transfer printer itself, it uses a ribbon that contains a wax-based ink. This is a different type of printer. Instead of a direct thermal, which uses just strictly heat off special paper, you have the thermal transfer, which actually transfers the wax-based ink to the page itself. Uh, heating element itself melts the ribbon onto the thermal paper. And it uses used for printing receipts as well, barcode labels, clothing labels, container labels, and it's extremely reliable, very easy to maintain, and it's very fast. Have you ever seen them print out shipping labels? I mean, they come out thousands of them in like a like a minute. I mean, it is insane how fast those print out. Um, so low maintenance, pretty simple devices and they're extremely fast and they're quiet. So these are really great for offices, especially if you're doing a lot of shipping and things like that, seats. So 
very efficient printers. And in IT, we love them just simply because it's low maintenance. Yes, DW. Yeah, we used to we use them in the in the restaurant industry too. We use them for for receipts, and then we use them. They have a like a special one that can print thermal, and it can also print on like a double sided paper, and so it makes a copy one for the kitchen and like one for like the serving side. But you but if you put but you have to have it set up like there's a switch in the back because it, I guess there's two technologies in it. Mm -hmm. So if you if you have it set on thermal and then you put in that paper, all you get is blank receipts. Yes. That's interesting. I didn't know they had the dual the dual uh, use ones in the uh, restaurant industry. I did not know that. Very cool. Basic view of a thermal printer, how it works. You have the, uh, the wax based ribbon as it deposits it onto the actual page itself. You have the thermal element, which is essentially drawing that image onto that thermal ribbon so that the uh, image can be transferred to the paper itself. All right. They don't get too heavy into the thermal printing. They tend to like more the other three families. You might get a question on thermal printing. Unless you got more, did you get any more than that, Mark? Or did you get just like one? Maybe one, uh, it was just general knowledge. Uh, they love okay. laser printers though. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. Speak of the devil. Laser printers. We are gonna become very, very familiar with them over time. Uh, they produce very high quality images. It's high speed for text and graphics. And it uses the process of electrophotographic imaging. A lot of technology went into the laser printer itself. They do not use ink. They use toner. So if ever you hear the term toner, that is only associated with laser printers, nothing else. So if they're talking about an inkjet and they mention toner, I guarantee you that answer is wrong. If you're, if they mention toner in the question, it has to be something about an inkjet or a uh, laser printer, excuse me. These terms are critical. As long as you understand them, a lot of times you can eliminate at least half your answers. So toner is associated with laser printers only. If you hear a ribbon, it's typically a dot matrix or it's typically an impact printer. They mention ink, it's an inkjet. Laser printers are non impact devices that precisely place toner on the page. And they range from low volume personal use to extreme high volume, high volume multi user. And some of these things can get extremely elaborate where they can even go ahead and laminate and bind entire books in one shot, a single printer. I mean, you can go from a couple hundred dollars up to tens of thousands of dollars for a single printer just in the laser in the laser printer family. They are more expensive up front than your typical laser jet, your, your late, your, excuse me, your typical inkjet printer or something like that. So the upfront cost is more, but over time, the cost of maintaining and running them is significantly lower. So that's where they get you with the inkjet. They're like, you know what? It's only 50 bucks for the printer. You know, you know, it's just a small investment. You're good to go. And then the real shock comes, you know, comes when you come back to buy ink the next time. Now, the inkjet or the laser printer will be $150 or something like that. But your toner is going to be half or a third of what the late or the inkjet is especially when you start getting into the per page calculations laser is still expensive though yes i agree jerusalem tech yes 
cartridges can be recycled technically, but there is a cost to that. So we will get into that with regards to the ink chess. Now, color printing, uh, instead, you know, unlike the black and white printing, it's the, color printing is the exact same thing, but in a laser, in a laser printer, what it does is it essentially repeats the entire process multiple times to run color. So it'll run it for, for black, it'll run it for yellow, it'll run it for cyan, you know, so it runs that same process multiple times in order to create color images themselves. So they use the four, was it black, cyan, magenta, and yellow? And black tones, typically it is a carbon melt mixed with a polyester resin. So it's like a plastic is what toner is. It's like this, it's almost, you know, it's essentially burnt, <laughs> burnt plastic is the, is the black toner. And, uh, you melt that resin into the page and that's where the color or the transfer takes place. And that is part of why it is far more permanent than just ink itself, because it becomes a part of uh, the paper. All right, so certain components we need to pay attention to paper transport, which is essentially what shuttles that paper through, your logic circuits, which is where it essentially it's like your motherboard for the printer. It's what receives the job and then kind of transfers that information to the other components. As if you know, it is a laser printer. It obviously has a laser involved in it. The laser itself is stationary, it utilizes a mirror to focus that image over onto the photosensitive drum. Um, as we talked about earlier, it uses toner instead of ink. So it uses toner cartridges to actually store and hold that toner uh, for when it is ready to be used. And then we have something called a primary Corona and a transfer Corona. What do these things do? Sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie. Well, these actually help either erase or create charges on these drums because a lot of the the magic with the laser printer is happening with the use of essentially static electricity then you have the fuse rollers which are essentially heated rollers that allow you to kind of cook or bake that toner into the page sealing that image into the page making it permanent if that doesn't heat up properly the images can smudge, the toner can just fall off because it's just a powder and it's being held on by kind of a static electricity. Uh, we will get into the Coronas again here in just a minute. This is just basically walking through the, uh, the pieces. Yes, Joseph. Uh, we are in the world of Corona. How is the virus Corona related to this primary and transfer Coronas here? Well, somebody wasn't paying attention when they were working on a printer and, th and they got cut by the Corona in the printer. And uh, it kind of, you know, allowed it to get out. And unfortunately they also worked at the Corona beer factory. So like all of that stuff kind of came together and just created, you know, a terrible situation. Uh, no, the Corona, <laughs> the Corona is mostly, mostly having to do with the charges so like they're, they're you know they're speaking with it with regards to a electrical charge all right but we will get into that here in just a little bit uh erasure lamp now we said it was a photosensitive drum right and we're, we're writing this image onto this drum right here and after that image is used, we need to clear it. So it comes back around and they use a bright light to erase whatever image has been placed onto that drum so that it can be ready for the next evolution of the drum itself. So like all this stuff is happening super fast. 
But again, we're going to walk through this process step by step here in just a few minutes. And we're just kind of talking about some of the components. <clears throat> so the erasure lamp helps wipe the, uh, the photosensitive drum clean. And then we have, as typical with anything, with any electronic device, you have a power supply, just like our, our computers. We have a power supply, right? Well, in a laser printer, in order to power the Coronas and the fusers, they have what is called a HVPS, which is a high voltage power supply. And it is what it says it is. So basically, if we tell you do not open up a normal power supply, times 10 for a high voltage power supply, even more dangerous. Field replaceable unit, do not open it. Do not play with it. If you are not a certified electrician, it is not worth the risk. Leave it alone. So high voltage power supply, regular power supplies, do not open. You either swap the whole thing out or you call an electrician if they want to try to repair it. And then obviously, so in order for it to be able to communicate with the computer and the computer to communicate with it, we need to have the proper drivers and software to set up that communication medium. So these are just the basic components. Now I believe we're gonna walk through the process of laser printing. So the first step in the laser printing process is processing. This is when the CPU or the, the computer itself sends the image over to the printer and it gets placed into an area of memory that we talked about yesterday, the print spooler, which is essentially the queue. It's where all these jobs line up in order, you know, waiting their turn to actually move through the printer itself. So after this, when the printer itself, the hardware on the printer receives the job, it begins to process that image and starts to generate, generate the image itself, essentially creating a bitmap for the final page. So it's processing that image, it's taking the information in, it's now processing what it needs to do. After this, our second step is charging. I would ignore conditioning. I would focus on charging because it tells you a little bit more about what's going on. This is going to make the drum itself receptive to new images. So after the erasure has happened, it's going to start charging. So it creates a negative charge upon the drum around 600 to 1,000 volts, negative. 600 to 1,000 volts. So creating this negative charge upon the drum. This charge is placed on there by the corona, the primary corona, puts this negative charge on the drum. So we've now created a negative charge on the drum. It's universal across the entire thing. So everything on it is the same. After it's been erased, it now has a negative charge. We've processed our image. It's time to move to step three. Step three is exposing. So what we're doing now is the laser itself is either using that mirror to create an image as to what is about to be printed upon that photosensitive drum. So we've created a negative charge on the drum. What happens because it's photosensitive, wherever light hits it, it decreases the charge on it. So we have, a, we have a negative 1,000 charge on this drum. The laser's hitting it, dropping that difference to about negative 100 or negative 200, something like that. So negative 200 volts, creating that difference between the rest of the drum and the actual image you're creating. So there's a more or a less negative charge upon it. And it's exposing the drum to the image that it needs to print. Are you with me so far? So we've processed our image. We've created a universal negative charge of, of negative 1,000 volts. Now we're etching the image of the page we want to print onto our page, which is wherever the laser hits, decreasing the voltage from about a negative 1,000 to about negative 100. 
Yes, Steven. So in step three, exposing is when it actually starts printing onto the paper? No, we haven't gotten to the paper yet. This is the drum. Mm. So this is that photosensitive drum. So first we erase the drum so that, the, you know, after we erase the drum, first we use that primary corona to create a universal negative charge on that drum. And then now we're using the laser to etch the image onto the drum itself. So the paper hasn't even come into play yet. So we've processed the image and we received it from our computer. We've created a universal charge on the drum. So we've charged it. Now we're exposing that drum, writing the image that we want to print onto the drum with the laser. So that's, that's the third step. Fourth step is developing. We now need to develop that image. As the roller rolls past the toner, the particles with the lesser negative charge or the sections of the drum with the lesser negative charge are going to attract the toner to it. So the toner is going to get sucked to the drum itself. And it's only going to stick to the portion of the drum that has the least negative charge. So the negative 100 section where we've etched it in with the laser. So that's developing it. So it's creating a developed image upon the drum with the toner. So we now have processing, charging, exposing, now developing. Doesn't do us much good to have that toner sitting on the drum. So now we need to transfer that toner to the page. Well, how do we get it to do that? Well, we have the transfer corona, which is another wire that essentially creates a charge. And this, this puts a positive charge. I think it's around like positive 500. So it puts a positive charge of positive 500 onto the page, the paper as it's passing through. Now, since it has a much stronger charge, and what is on the drum, as it passes near the drum, all those particles that are attached, attract, uh, attached to the drum will now jump to the page. So we first use that difference in charge to attract the toner to the drum. Now we're using another difference in charge to attract the toner from the drum to the page itself. So the toner, as, as the page is passing through, it's, it's dropping all that toner onto the page. Yes, Cynthia. So basically the drum is just like, if I look at it from just the physical aspect, the drum is just a negative, it's gonna create negative particle or negative charges so that when the image is developed through the transmission, the, 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 the development is pretty much black and white. It's like the drum is saying, hey, I'm here. And then that beautiful connection of uh, yin and yang, they start to come together, compress, mm -hmm. and then the images start to form. Yes, kind of like that. Okay, I'm just trying to, I'm literally like trying to go along the way with this. Yes. <laughs> I've, I've never ever looked at the, I never knew the steps to this. I'm not gonna, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. When I first read this, I was actually, from an engineering, because I was I first started out studying engineering when I went to school. From an engineering perspective, I found this amazingly fascinated how they actually thought this through. That's so I actually was I, I kind agree. of fascinated by the process. Yeah, it's just interesting because I've never ever. I mean, I've looked inside like printers, but I've never looked at the engineering aspect of it. So I'm trying mm -hmm. to see how they, right. Like I, that's why I'm trying to wrap my head around the engineering perspective of things how that came into process. Yes. So, and just figuring out all these little things just to make it work and it works very well. Now with the negative charge, is that how it's wired in the drum just to, to like, that's what I'm trying to understand. So like when I'm looking through the physical aspects of things, when the drum itself is just designed to be a negative charge, like that. Uh, well, the Corona trend is able, it is able to receive that charge from the primary Corona. 
through, you know, because it is photo, it is, it's photo electric, it's like photoelectric or something like that. Yeah, photoelectric drum. And it is able to receive that charge from the, um, from the primary corona. Now, here's the thing is light destroys that. So if you open up a laser printer and you see that transfer, you're, you're essentially, you know, dispersing any charge that is on it based off of the light. And please never, 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 ever touch the photosensitive drum with your hand. That will essentially completely ruin it. Did you have another question, Cynthia? No. Okay. So yeah, the, the, the corona adds the charge to it, which is a negative charge. And then the light dispel, dispels that charge or diminishes it. So we've transferred it to the paper. So we've taken, we've used static electricity essentially to take the toner from the toner cartridge, put it on the drum, and then we used it again to take it from there and put it on the page. But it's still just being held there with static electricity. So that it's, it's the difference in charge that is holding those particles to the page that has formed that image. So what do we got to do? Well, we got to bake it. So we go to the fusing process, which are two rollers that are heated up and it kind of smushes and melts that toner down into the page, baking that image down into the page, solidifying it and making it the, the final product you see. As you probably have noticed, if you ever grab something off of a laser printer, immediately after it comes out, that paper's hot, right? And that's because of the fuser assembly that has now cooked that that resin into the page, solidifying that image. So that is the fusing process. And then at the end, we got to clean everything up, you know, because we got to start this process all over again as that drum is cycling around. So what happens is, is there's a little rubber blade in there that scrapes off any residual toner, puts it into a reclaiming bin in the toner cartridge, and there's a light, which is that erasure bulb that we talked about on the previous page, um, right here, uh, the erasure lamp that puts a uniform bright light across that uh, photosensitive drum and erases the drum, allowing that process to start over again. And this process just keeps repeating over and over and over and over and over again as your prints are being made. So this happens very fast. These seven steps just keep happening in a perpetual uh, process. So we have our seven steps. Now, how do we remember them and in the correct order? So we have our seven steps. Processing, charging, exposing, developing, transferring, using and cleaning. So we have two mnemonics to remember this. The first one, <clears throat> we'll go to the G version first. Please come every day to feel complete. So please come to class. Please come every day to feel complete. So that is our first one. The other version, which everybody seems to remember is printers can't even do the effing cleaning. For some reason that one always sticks. 
Yeah, that one works out pretty good. So. Kelly, I have a question. Yes. So I just want to make sure I understand the cleaning drum. Uh, at the end, the barber blade is actually the corona wire. It's that, it's, that's, that's what's making it uh, clear the drum. It's that corona no. wire. Rubber it's the blade. light. It's just the light. Okay. It's the um, erasure lamp because it's photosensitive. So okay. the exposure to light diminishes or neutralizes the charge upon the drum. Okay. So the light erases the drum and then immediately after the light, then it hits the, the primary corona again, which is reapplying that negative charge so that it's ready to start receiving the image again. So what is, what is the purpose of the barber blade? To scrape off any residual uh, toner that may not have been transferred in the process prior. Okay. So sometimes like it may, like the, not all the toner might have got come off the, the roller. This just cleans up any residual toner allowing it to be a fresh start. <laughs> but you know, you have two C's here. Always remember cleaning comes at the end, you know, so that won't confuse you. Processing is always your first things. Some of this stuff, fusing comes right before you clean. So some of this stuff can make it a little easier to kind of put in place what's going on. You just need to understand what's happening inside each step. Yes, Rachel. Does this not remind you of developing photographs? To a degree, yes. Would agree. Kelly? Yes. Can I, I was, I was thinking like, cause I know Hunter, I, I feel Hunter. So please clean every day to feel clean. How about that? Yeah. I mean, whatever works for you, these are just the ones that we've come across. So it actually clears your mind every time you, you go through this process. You know, it's just, the, the yeah. point is just to remember the steps and in their yeah. order. Whatever you need to do, if you come up with new mnemonics, please share them. We will, yeah. you know, we'll use them for future classes. These are the two that we've come across. And there's, you know, there's always a few people who don't necessarily, you know, want to hear any cussing. So, you know, we give them the G version and uh, they tend to be okay with that. I had a, I had a um, study partner in my first group. She was adamant about that first one. So please come every day to feel complete. That's the only one I'll accept. And, uh, Everybody else seemed to remember printers can't even do the effing cleaning. So it's all, it's personal preference. So we're always open to new mnemonics if we come across them. So, because we want to offer up as many possible study tips as we can. Who remembers the mnemonic for the ports? All right, Julian, what is it? <laughs> performance anxiety hold on <laughs> no, he, he has guests so oh yeah 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 company right <laughs> All right, nobody heard me on that one. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, printers can't even do the effing cleaning. Yes, that's well, that's for printing. I'm asking, what what is the mnemonic for ports? Oh, yeah, for ports. ports. Yeah. There we go. Julian's got it. For safe technicians, simple deeds help put immature hackers at rest. Those are the primary uh, ports that we need to know for the A plus. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Nice work, Julian. Very good. Very good. All right. Any questions so far? Oh.
Nobody has any questions at this point. Printer experts. Wow. I love it. <laughs> we are, you know, I, I mean, joking aside, I do believe we're going to set some records in this class with regards to uh, certifications, A plus pass, you know, pass rates and stuff like that. I do believe that because we've set a record every single cohort and this is the next evolution of that. And it is a larger class. So I feel it is absolutely going to happen. Uh, okay. Good job guys. If you've got this build on it, here we go. What's the highest for class? I think so far we've had what it's like, they're still taking them, but we have nine up and nine passed for 1001 for our previous cohort so far. And we currently have two up. Well, we have. Daddy. Hold on one second. Come look at the video game I'm playing. No. <laughs> Sorry. All right. But uh, yeah, we've had four up, two pass with regards to A plus, but the two that didn't pass quite literally missed by one question. And they are they are literally going to be retaking it within so, like a week or two. Because they were they were literally that close. It was it was I mean, that, that is like the hardest one is it's legitimate. It was like two points. So quite literally one question, but they didn't let it discourage them. And they are going to be passing it on this next run. So pretty high rates, especially with regards to percentage, because we only had how many at the, at the end last time was it Mark? Were we at about what? 15, 15 people. Yeah. So 15 over half have passed their 1001. And uh, currently working, we still have others lining up to take their 1001, and then we're starting to see some lining up to take their 1002. Yeah. So. Good stuff. Yes, Cynthia. When are we supposed to uh, schedule our 1001? After we get through with the four big families of printers, we have something else called a virtual printer. I always thought it was kind of a silly term, but hey, it's kind of like saving a document. So a virtual printing is a way that is not quite really printing, but it allows you to con convert a document to a particular format of your choice. So you can print the file, which produces a file that can be later printed without access to the program that created it. You can print to a PDF, which produces an Adobe PDF image instead of a printout. You could do a virtual, you know, a virtual PDF printer can be downloaded from Adobe, other third party software. I think Adobe is no longer supporting that. I can't remember. Something's been going on with Adobe with regards to that. Or is that Flash Player? I think it's Flash remember. Player. Okay, flash players no longer be supported, yeah. but the, the PDF is still good. Okay. Just being sure. Uh, there's print to XPS, which is a document standardized open format. And it's kind of Microsoft's answer to the PDF, although they tend to, they're starting to embrace the PDF a little more. Uh, it is always offered as a print type in Windows. You have print to image, which is kind of like scanning. And it creates an image of the document and saves it like a normal image file, like a GIF, a JPEG, PNG, TIFF, what have you. Common features of all printers. Typically, uh, they, they all have to operate off of a similar language. They need to know how to talk to the computers, things like that. So for simple text, they may use the ASCII. If we remember that, we were talking about binary. Um, 
Some other printers are starting to use PostScript, which was developed by Adobe. And uh, the image is done by the printer itself and not the PC's CPU. Moving on a little bit further, we have the printer control language or PCL. And this was developed by Hewlett Packard, but it does not support advanced graphics. Windows, I believe, currently uses GDI or graphics device interface to handle print functions and then sends it to the printer itself. And then so Windows 7 and above, XML paper specifications, or XPS, which has some improvements over GDI. Now, mainly with these, you need to understand these acronyms and associate them with printing languages. You need to know all the super details of each one of these? No, not for this. But you need to understand when you're looking at it that they are printing languages. So PostScript, PCL, GDI, XPS. Whenever you see those, they should instantly tell you they are talking about printer languages. Because they may ask you, what is an example of a printer language? It might be helpful to write them down in order because this is kind of how they were developed. So you, you know, you can kind of quickly tell which one is the most advanced of them. Now, when you open up your printer properties inside of Microsoft or what have you, when you're looking at your printer, there are specific properties that are kind of universal. You have a just page orientation, which would give you your portrait, which is straight up and down, and then landscape, which has your page side to side. Your resolution, how many dots per inch are you looking for? DPI. Collation. Does anybody know what collation is? What do they mean by that? Yes, Rachel. Collation is normally the the order of the pages, I think. You are, yeah, you're correct. Can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, if I said, if I had a, if I had five presentations, each presentation was about five pages, what would it look like if it was not collated versus collated? It would not put the presentation papers in the order of your presentation. So if it was not collated, it would print page one, page one, page one, page one, right? Mm -hmm. And if we actually collated it. It groups it together in the Exactly. Order. So it'd be page one, page two, page three, page four. Oh, and it would go to the next presentation and go page one, page two, page three, page four. So you don't have to separate it out at the end. Nice, Rachel. Very good. So that is coalition. Yes, you want to be able to remember that. Coalition and duplex. What was duplex again? Hey, take off your shoes. A real green. It's not two houses stuck together. Side. It's printing, printing on both sides of the paper. Yes, Joseph. Oh, yeah, somebody just answered. I wanted to. So okay. asking what is duplex? Duplex, yes, it's printing on both sides of the paper. So printing on both sides of the paper, very good. So you can manage your duplex printing in here. You can also manage your printer size and types and source. Now with smaller printers, it's not really a big deal. You have one source, you have the tray. You know, you have your paper tray. Some of them may have it where you can feed it in through the top. But when you start talking about industrial size, laser printers and stuff like that, they may have six, seven trays on that darn thing. And they have different types of paper in each tray. You may have legal paper in some, you may have just standard printing paper in others. You may have um, 
thicker weight paper for like presentations and resumes and another. So depending on what you're doing, you may use different types of paper and each paper may be looked differently in each tray. And you have to tell the printer what's there. So it knows what it's using. And then all of them offer an ability for us to print a test page, which, which step of the troubleshooting process would this fall under? Not of the, not of the uh, printing, I'm talking about troubleshooting. We're going back to a couple Ver of weeks ver ago. Verifying functionality. There we go, verifying functionality. So this is that's where we would use this step. If you know they tell us the printer is broken, it's not working, we can't do anything with it. When we're all said and done, we want to verify functionality. We print a test page. We can also use it in one other step. What other step would we use it for? Yes, Cynthia. In troubleshooting, you have to test uh, your your theory to see if what you did in the process. It, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I just went in like in the troubleshooting. I know that if you're verifying the functionality, mm -hmm. you have to test it, right? Like you're 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 making sure yeah. that what your theory, the theory you put in, and the um, your theory yeah. is tested so that it is actually uh, proven to be the case. And, okay. Right. So if if you're oh. testing the printer to or if you part if to see that it's functioning, you're you're basically just testing your theory. I'm probably missing the point of the question, but no, you're not missing the point of it. You know, I like I like your reasoning behind it. Uh, Jessica. Um, just to confirm, you're asking why else would we print a test page? Well, in the troubleshooting process. So we said we would use it in the verifying functionality phase of troubleshooting, like if we're trying to solve a problem with the printer. Mm -hmm. But I was asking in what other step in troubleshooting might we use the print test page as well? By chance, would it have to do anything with like the calibration to check the calibration of how the printing, how everything is printing to make sure everything's printing out? Well, that's exactly why you would use the printed test pages to kind of look and see how okay, the calibration so is setting up. Okay, gotcha. But um, I'm trying to figure out like what other, because we have the, the six steps of troubleshooting. I'm trying to think of other than verified functionality, where else might this be extremely useful? DW, you had your hand up? The clean? Not, well, that's in the, the laser printing. You're, you're, you're going into the laser printing step. Ah. We're talking about troubleshooting. Okay, DW. <laughs> Um, I think you could use it when you're diagnosing the problem, trying to recreate the problem that the user is having. Or the, you know. Identifying the problem. So you might run a test page just to kind of see what they're seeing. Yeah. So here we go. Identify the problem. Um, also, testing theory works there, too. So there are, there are multiple places where, you know, verifying functionality. There might be multiple test pages printed to kind of see how things are evolving through the troubleshooting process while you're working on the printers. So very good, putting some of these puzzle pieces together a little bit. They're not all separate silos. They do have a lot of crossover. So nice. All right, connecting and installing basics. So printers can be connected to a local computer physically or to a network. Now, what might the connector look like on the printer side of that USB? What kind of connector do they typically use? That's on the printer side, Steven. That's that USB 2.0, which it could be a 2.0, it could be a 3.0. I'm not looking for generation, I'm looking for type. What's the question, Kelly? I'm sorry, I couldn't. What type of connector would we use on the cable on the printer side? What type of connector would we use? Good job, Moftuna. She's close, close. Yes, Glee. Um, I was uh, a DVI, in most cases. Uh, well, DVI, DVI would be for a monitor, right? Yeah, but well, I mean, a DVI to a USB, right? No. Or, or I'm sorry, it's the uh, it's the USB, but I'll never get these right. 
it's like it's the USB. USB. All right. Well, the USB goes into the computer. Yes. But the, but the other end is not. It, it's a. It's a. It's a specific like hexagon type port that goes in. I forgot what they call that. Specific. Um, it's got, it's got kind of got a simulators with that. Think of a Bob. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's, 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 it's so much of a college, you know? It's, it's like, you know, USB-A you know, connector. Like, you know. Yeah, Muff has a right USB-A yeah. connector. No, nope, not an A. It's not an A. Uh, that's my fault, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not an A. A is the standard one. That's the that's the one we... The it's, a, little, it's a B, right? It's a B. All right, own up to it. USB-B. Who said that? My bad. My is that Robert? USB-B. Yeah, that was Robert. Nice work, Robert. USB-B. That is that square looking connector. It's not so much rectangular, it's square. And then there's the USB B 3.0, which has the blue. And then it looks like that little square, but it's got a little hat on it. So excellent, excellent work. So typically with printers, you're gonna have the USB B connector on the printer side. And that's gonna be that physical connection. Um, also, we can use the serial or parallel ports for the much older printers. Yes, Cynthia. I was gonna, I was gonna say the old ones was the PADAs, right? Those are the ones that you did with the. Not PADA. It used a serial because remember the PADA is the long flat ribbon. Right. That's what I was saying. It's like long. It's like a whole bunch of. Paint. But it had it did have that fat head, which was that yeah. serial port. You know right. the big. So you, yeah, you screw them in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was like the DB 15s, I believe. No. No, they were they like a DB twenty five. DB twenty five. Yes, there you go. Yep. Yeah, sorry. DB fifteen was the VGA. What does DB stand for? Having a having a amnesia moment. Who can tell me what DB stands for? What is that? Was that short for? What was that? Database? Not database. DB. Hmm. What does it look like? It's like a DB15 or DB25. What does that DB stand for in that in that name? Yes, Rachel. Something like, I want to say B sub miniature. It's not something like that. It is exactly that. So yes, D sub miniature. And it has that kind of a rhombus shape. So bring out my super awesome skills here. It's more like an HD, uh, you know, that looks more like a HDMI cable than a thing, but you have you. Let's try it a different way. Straight, straight. Yeah, a little bit better. What is it they say? Everybody has 10,000 bad drawings in their hand. I think I've exceeded that and I haven't gotten any better. What did uh, Rachel say that it stands for? I didn't have D I, I sub did. miniature. D sub, sub miniature. And that is a family of connectors. And then the number at the end is the pins that are in each connector. And so we have DB15, it has 15 pins. That is our typical monitor connector for older monitors. And it's an analog connector with 15 pins in it. It's typically the little blue one. DBIs tend to be white, fatter, and they have the the fun little pin configurations that we so love on our jam boards because we just Hi. the jam boards are awesome i'm going to give you guys all copies to take home with you for christmas so you can play around with them all right we can also other than you know, the local connections, we also can utilize Wi-Fi to correct directly to him. Did you have another question, Cynthia? Sorry. No, that's, that, was, that was it. Okay. 
Um, we can also connect through them through Wi-Fi as well over the network. Uh, but we also can set them up network printers as well through Wi-Fi or Ethernet. Most local printers are plug and pray compatible, but all require drivers to communicate with computers. So essentially when you first plug them in, it's, you know, when it hooks up to your computer, you might have an HP 5732 and you plug it in your computer and it says, okay, I know how to talk to HP 5000 series printers. So you get basic communication, you can print out test pages, you can kind of start talking to it, do basic functions, but you need to download the drivers and all that stuff so that you can get full functionality out of that printer. Sometimes it happens automatically. Sometimes we actually have to go out and do it manually. Now, Windows 7 has a multitude of drivers built in and downloaded. Uh, but if you don't have the basic drivers on hand, you can go out to the manufacturer's website and download it. And or it may come on an optical drive with the printer or an optical disc with the printer, sometimes a USB. But fail safe, you can always go to the manufacturer's website and download whatever applicable drivers you need. All right. <clears throat> and of course, you need to use 32-bit drivers for a 32-bit operating system and 64-bit for a 64-bit operating system. All right, basic for local setup. Plug it in, turn it on. At that point, install the drivers. It's about as easy as it gets. And that's just a local printer. You got it on the side of your computer. You're hooking it up directly to your desk. That's all you need to do. After that, if you're using the Windows installation process, you can add a printer. You open your printers and faxes window, follow the add printer wizard directions. And then when you're done, we're gonna verify our functionality, print a test page. All right, print servers. Print servers can either be hardware or software that manages print jobs sent to one or more printers on a network. Print servers can be as simple as quite literally a desktop set up next to the printer and its sole purpose is to just be a print server for that printer. If it is not a network printer, essentially you set it up there, you share it with the rest of the office and that computer itself is operating as a print server. It can also be software installed onto uh, the printer itself. It can be um, excuse me, sorry. So it can be a dedicated device or it can be uh, dedicated firmware on the printer itself. So the embedded firmware print server can be used to manage print jobs itself. You can view the printer status. You can see the history of stuff that's been printed. You can check the counters and see how many pages have been printed since your last maintenance cycle. Uh, and all these utilities can be accessed through a browser when you connect to the printer itself on the network. And you have Windows Print Management. It monitors and manages the printer queue for all printers on the network. If you're seeing extremely high spikes in one particular printer, you can sometimes disperse that uh, weight across the uh, network if need be. And in print management, each computer on the network that shares it uh, is considered a print server. Fun thing about network printers is, is your proximity to that printer doesn't really matter. You need to make sure you're hooking up to the right printers. This is such a common problem in, uh, 
you know, companies that stretch across multiple cities and you have people that kind of travel between them. Uh, we had this happen where my boss at my previous company was down here in Jacksonville. He went up for training to Columbus, Ohio. He was in Columbus, Ohio for like two weeks, came back down. He needed to print some uh, manuals for the rest of us in the office uh, for us to be able to do our work. He ran this print job five times, couldn't get it, couldn't figure out why it wasn't printing. It was showing that the job was there. It was processing. Everything was working great, but for some reason it wasn't coming out of the printer. Then we get a phone call from Columbus, Ohio saying, stop, please stop blowing up our printers. Because it was a networked printer, he was still communicating with the printer back in Ohio because it was viewed as if being on the same network. So you have to take care which printers you're hooking up. And then when you're, when you're, putting these printers in place, name them something that you know where they are. Like, you know, if you have multiple cities like Columbus, Ohio, third floor HR, you know, you know exactly where that printer is. Don't just name it HP 5723i. Nobody knows where that is. So when you're naming things, name them in such a way where you can identify them. And I think what had happened with those is like our printer in Jacksonville had a J and theirs had an I. And that was the only difference in the names of those printers. So there was like, you know, couldn't figure it out. So he printed like 2000 pages worth of stuff up in their office when he needed to print it for us. Is anybody else lagging or is it just Julie? Nobody's lagging. Okay, just checking. All right, steps to share an installed printer. If you're in Windows 7, you got to make sure you turn on file and printer sharing. Make sure that is, you know, that is selected otherwise you will not be able to do this 8.1 printer sharing was turned on and then the basic steps for windows 7 8 and 10 you open the properties dialog box select sharing this is on your printer icon like when you go into your printers and uh equipment like that open the die open the properties dialog box by right clicking on it select sharing then you can select share this printer and at that point you can create a name for this printer Um, and then you can make sure the drivers are available for everybody because they don't have the proper drivers. They're not going to be able to communi effect communicate effectively with that printer. So pretty Kelly? basic steps. Yes, sir. Do we have a test out lab for this one? You know, I think we might. Yeah, I think we do. <laughs> oh, man, you're welcome. There's a test out print. There's a test out uh, lab for this. So... <laughs> we try we try to bring all the tools we can so good one to walk through it's pretty simple straightforward but worth you know going through it a couple times just to develop that muscle memory all right now if you want to install a shared printer you can use windows explorer and then network and network places window from there. Uh, you can also use the control panel devices and printers in Windows 7, Windows 8, it's in control panel, hardware and sound. Click, click on advanced printer setup. And then you select the third radio button option and add printer using a TCP IP address or host name. You can look it up by its actual IP address which if you have like a network laser, uh, laser printer or something like that on the menu, on the printer, you can actually look up and see what the IP address is and it'll give it to you. So you can go ahead and just manually input it if you want, or you can look it up by its name. If you're in a small office, you may just be able to run a search for names and then just click on whichever one you need. If you're in a large office or if you work for a large company that has, like my previous company had hundreds of printers, this was a bad way to look for printers. Because uh, you would run a search on the network and it would just give you a just a list of printers and none of them were named anything that would let you identify what they were. So it was quite literally 
if you didn't know the exact name, you weren't getting to the printer you needed. At least not anytime soon. All right, printer queue management. What is a queue? It's basically just a line. This is what the Brits call it. So, access the print queue by double clicking the printer icon, either in your devices and printers window or on the taskbar when it is active. Then you can look at spooled print jobs. You know, they're all displayed at that point. The options are available through the toolbar, including pause printing, cancel printing, stuff like that. If you got a, a jammed up print spooler, you don't want to just keep hitting reprint, 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 because when that jam finally clears, you're going to get 20 prints of that document. So unfortunately, if you have a print jam, you kind of you clear all print jobs and then you kind of let everybody know. We're clearing the spooler. Any print jobs that you have not received, you're going to go ahead and need to reprint. Uh, that way you don't get a lot of waste of people reprinting stuff 20 times. Routine maintenance. As with anything else, it gets dirty over time, needs to be cleaned. Uh, cleaning will help extend a printer's working life. And as we don't want to be in the business of just throwing money away, we want to try to get as much out of whatever equipment we have. So unfortunately, unlike the movies in real life, IT does not have an endless budget. Now, you always use, follow the manufacturer's directions for device use and cleaning. When you're cleaning the outside of the printer, you can use a slightly damp cloth, not chemicals. And then follow up quickly with a dry cloth. This is extremely important. Do not ever use compressed air on a, a laser dip printer. Because if there is any debris, Two things will happen. You know, you're blowing debris further into the printer where it will get jammed up later. Or if you have a bunch of toner in there, you're going to be blowing that toner out everywhere. And if anybody I hear has ever cleaned up toner, that is not a pleasant experience. It doesn't just wipe up. You never use ammonia-based cleaners, so you can damage the printers irreparably, and only use safe tools. So if you're, if you're gonna be cleaning up toner, they actually have toner certified vacuum cleaners and have magnetic brushes to kind of help clean all that stuff up. And printer software may contain a program to clean inkjet nozzles as well as calibrating and aligning the print heads themselves on many of your ink jets, There's actually like a sponge off to the side. If you've ever seen the carriage, either before it starts cleaning, printing or after it's done, it kind of like sits off to the side and kind of jets back and forth a lot. Like it's, you know, kind of trying to fix itself. There's a moist sponge in there. And what it's doing is it's cleaning off any dried up or debris that might be on the end of the print heads before it starts to print. So it actually has its own little cleaning process that it will do. You can manually engage it. Like if the printer has been sitting for a while before, you know, since your last print, you may want to run a cleaning cycle. Um, also that sponge may need to be re-moistened from time to time or replaced. And they have uh, printer maintenance kits that have the most common parts that wear out. Uh, they, this will vary based on the printing manufacturer. And typically they will give you step-by-step -step instructions, how to apply that kit. It could be new rollers, it could be new pads, it could be um, like little, uh, like the, <sighs> the ribbons that the carrot, that run the carriage, like the driving ribbons. It could be any number of things. If, the, if these parts typically wear out quickly and easily, the 
regular maintenance kit that you'll apply to it will typically address this. Yes, Jessica. If you could just go back real quick. So with the last slide in regards to maintenance, um, I'm assuming because I have my printer and I'm like, I ain't never clean my printer, you know? So I want to confirm, you know, this is of course for like those super duper when you're in the office, those printers, um, because right. they usually do, if it ain't a paper jam, it's something else. So that is something that, okay, that you want to make sure that you follow up with is, you know, like with your car, where every X of miles, you got to get like an oil change. Mm -hmm. um, how often would you do a routine maintenance? Like, would it be something you do quarterly, twice a year, maybe? Um, typically on printers, it's based off page count. So when you hit a specific page count, like that's where the counter is in the print spooler, it tells you how many pages you printed. Mm -hmm. Typically they'll say like every 5,000 pages, <clears throat> you need to run a maintenance kit through it. Oh, cool. Okay. Thank you. And before we continue, let's take a moment of silence for Jessica's printer. And uh... she's still going, baby. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> for for the but lack of maintenance know, like, it I has received so over the years. I was years. like, oh man. I was like, man, after class, we have to have a little, you know, quality time. But yes. <laughs> Mostly it's just dusting it. It's like it's making sure you don't get dust and debris down in there. That way it can still function effectively. If you get dust okay, and debris I do down that. in there. I do that. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> So yeah, it's it's typically it's based off a of page count, especially with regards to laser printers, because they they um, they have pretty tight uh, maintenance schedules outside of you know swapping out the toner and stuff like that. But good question though. So overarching problems, solving tips. You know, when problems arise, remember document everything, uh, especially if you. You know, if somebody brings something to you, you need to document the condition it was brought to you in, any physical damage you may see, things of that nature, just because you want to make sure that, you know, things that weren't your issue are not attributed to you. I would never say people would try to do something like that, but people would try to do something like that. Um, so you start with the simple solutions first. Air, you know, ergo, verify the printer is connected to the computer. It's plugged in on both sides. It's turned on. Proper drivers are downloaded. You know, start with the simple stuff first. Work into ever more complex issues. You can also use the online support, going through the manufacturer's websites, frequently asked questions, stuff like that. Online forums are a good place as well. Yes, Jessica. I'm just curious because I know um, for companies I used to work with, whenever the printer went down, wow. it wasn't our IT person who addressed it. Um, mm -hmm. It was usually like a third party, like the actual uh, manufacturer, like vendor type, like a service provider would come out and work on that. Is that common practice? Because normally it's either a frustrated employee or you know who who's trying to well, fix the printer. <laughs> I've never, for some reason, I don't know if anybody else can share that, but I've never... I never had the association printers down. Where's our IT person, if that makes sense? Yeah, Typically IT, when you, you, I, IT usually, no, I'm just saying, IT is usually somebody we call on the phone. We need to reset our password. So <laughs> basically, yeah. like, like I can't get my password or can you reset my password or something like that. I, I've always seen outside vendors come in with a little black bag. Exactly. Now I'm gonna be like, I know where my IT person at. Let, let, let oh, me. Exactly. Been <laughs> I want to learn something. Real. I'm gonna technically say they're considered IT as well. They just may not be the IT for the company. Right. When you when right. you lease, okay. we, and Susan nailed it. When you yep. lease a laser printer, because these things are expensive. You know, especially oh, yeah. when you're talking about the big ones that they use in offices and something. Like this yeah. is expensive. So rather than buying it and just owning it, sometimes it's better to just lease it for a couple of years and then you can upgrade and lease a new one. So, you know, there are decisions that are made. And when you make those leases, there are maintenance um, packages that come along with it. Like they're going to handle 
all the IT stuff. If anything breaks, if anything goes wrong, they're going to come in gotcha. and fix it. So rather than you have your IT people try to troubleshoot it, you already have that built-in maintenance system set up. They usually have third-party techs that work for multiple printer companies, and they'll just, they kind of travel around and take care of whatever problems are occurring, perform maintenance kits, all that kind of fun stuff on a pretty regular basis. So will you do this kind of stuff? Again, the answer always comes down to, it depends. You should have the ability to basically, you know, do some basic troubleshooting, solve some basic issues with regards to printers. Uh, if you're working in, you know, smaller companies, again, you got to wear more hats if you're in a smaller company. So yeah, you likely will be doing uh, more troubleshooting with printers, but setting up the printers, getting people back online with them, all that kind of stuff. Yes, if you get into mechanical failure of the printers, that's likely going to be an outside tech. So does that answer the question? Definitely, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, problem solving strategies, local printer problems. Steps to try, verify the printer is on and try printing a test page. I help identify that problem. If it doesn't print, use the troubleshooting in the windows to locate the issue because many times it'll just tell you, here's what the problem is. Out of memory error, larger printers and offices, it, you know, if a whole bunch of people are trying to print, it may actually run out of the ability to store those jobs. So the internal RAM might not be able to hold all the jobs and especially fonts. If anybody's ever dealt with a graphics designer and all that stuff, these guys love fonts. I mean, they'll have like 20 or 30,000 different fonts that they'll play with. And that eats up so much memory on printers and stuff like that. So uh, cases like that, you know, where they're regularly going to be utilizing this stuff, you may need to add extra memory or RAM to these larger printers. If you are not in control of the maintenance of that printer, you would call in the tech and say, hey, this thing's not sufficient. We need to upgrade the memory on it. They would come in, take care of that for you. If you're responsible for it, it's not an overly uh, onerous job to upgrade RAM modules. So questions so far? Yes, and if anything we get out of this program, please be nice to your IT people. They have a pretty hard day. All right, problem solving strategies for network connectivity. First, verify that the correct printer that you're trying to communicate with is your default printer. Next, Verify the IP address, which you can use, you can generally get pretty easily on the settings menu on the printer. They have a little screen that you can toggle through on the settings. And if it's a network capable printer, it will tell you what the IP address is. Verify that against what you ha already have in your system to make sure it's talking to the right thing. Verify the printer itself is online. Once you have that IP address, you can run a ping to that IP address through the command line and see if you can communicate with it. Next, reboot the computer. Uninstall, then reinstall the printer. Or lastly, use some of the diagnostic utilities software that comes with it. So just some basic strategies that you can use whenever you get the, my printer doesn't work phone call. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints? Who's more green conscious now? Come on, raise your hand. I've been green conscious for decades. I know, but, but after today, who, who is more let's save the trees, you know? Most of my coworkers now don't bother with the printer. We'll just send it to your phones. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, basically. <laughs> yeah, so don't even worry. Once it gets to your phone, then you can deal with it in any way you choose. Exactly. 
All right, other, <laughs> other problem solving strategies for shared printers. Print a test page from the local computer, make sure it's not a localized issue to that printer. <clears throat> Verify, again, you have the correct printer set as your default and it is selected online. And then at a remote computer, verify access to the computer to which the printer is attached. And then lastly, delete the printer and reinstall it and verify drive space. So many problems are, are solved by just rebooting, like re, restarting a computer and or deleting or reinstalling the applications you're working with. So many problems are solved that way. The caveats start to come in when you're talking about the data involved and making sure all that is backed up. All right, printing from Windows or applications. So if it's all locked up, start by deleting the print jobs in the queue. Don't continue to keep try to resending it because all you're doing is adding to the problem. So delete the print jobs from the queue, start over. Verify the correct printer is selected and online. Always a big one. Check your cables and connections because Sometimes they, like if the printer has been moved, they may have forgot to reconnect the ethernet cable to it, thereby you would not be able to see it. Stop and restart the spooler. And then some of the stuff is repetitive. Delete and reinstall the printer. Update your drivers to make sure you're communicating in the same language. Try to print to a file to see if it's the actual uh, printer properties on your computer, rather than the, you know, the network or the printer itself and print from safe mode. So boot into safe mode and print from there. All right. Poor print quality. I want you to memorize these two words, garbled text. If ever you hear those two words the only answer that is acceptable is update drivers so garbled text it's like you know when you're starting to print something out, i'm sure if you've, ever, if you've ever had this you print it out and it looks like a whole bunch of just random symbols on the page makes no sense whatsoever <clears throat> that means it's able to print but it's not able to translate what the computer is sending it. So it needs an updated driver so that they can be talking the same language and print out what it is you've sent. So garbled text or random symbols means you need to update your drivers. That is, that is the answer. Doesn't matter how many different ways we try to ask that question, that's the answer. All right. Wrong print colors. Some paper is designed to print only on one side. If you've ever printed like the photo paper from the laser or not laser, the uh, ink jets, they have one side that's kind of glossy, one side that's kind of matte. So it's only supposed to be printed on one side. Make sure the paper is loaded properly into the printer. Um, trick I've always used is I'll draw an arrow on a piece of paper, put it on the top of the print. I'll print one page and then I'll see how it comes out of the printer. So I know the orientation as it passes through the printer <clears throat> is one way to determine that and do that on inexpensive paper uh, before you start doing like the, the real nice photo paper. Adjust the quality of your print because uh, it might be set at a lower quality. And if it's for an inkjet, try cleaning because you may have partially clogged uh, nozzles uh, on the cartridges and also recalibrating the printers because the dots may not be lining up properly. Like they may be essentially off by a couple millimeters 
And so it, the images, like the colors don't blend properly. So recalibrating the printer is a really good um, fix for this at this point. So cleaning and recalibrating. And then for a laser printer also comes in the same, try recalibrating. Because remember for every single color that you add on a laser printer, it has to run through that seven step process for each page every time. So the color laser printers are much bulkier than just a regular laser printer. Poor print quality issues for laser printers. A lot of it can be solved by downloading better drivers or uploading your drivers. Um, if you have to do any work on a laser printer, unplug it and let it cool down for at least 30 minutes. Remember, inside there you have a fuser that fuser is hot it will heat other things up so let it cool for at least 30 minutes so you do not burn yourself uh take out the toner cartridge if it's got like if the printing is light like it's very very faded take out the toner cartridge and rock it a little bit and then put it back do not shake it <laughs> Trust me when I tell you, you will only ever shake a toner cartridge one time in your life. Rock it just to kind of, you know, break things up a little bit, disperse the toner a little evenly, put it back in, and you might get a couple more days out of that toner cartridge, buy you some time until the next one can be shipped to you. Uh, you can put it on econo mode, which uses significantly less toner, or it may be turned on, and that's why things are coming out lighter. It looks like a rough draft, so it's you know it may already be on economy mode. Paper quality itself may not be high enough. Another thing is it may just need cleaning, like Jessica's printer. It may just need to be cleaned. Just needs a little love. You know what? This is why I'm here. You know, the more you know, guys, I was brave for revealing my truth, okay? <laughs> Don't let me regret it, Kelly. <laughs> we respect it. We respect it. Uh, the laser drum may need to be replaced from time to time. That is the case because, you know, with the charging it and, uh, releasing of the charges over time, it becomes less and less effective. Uh, distorted image can be caused by debris or foreign material inside the printer itself. Uh, one of the biggest um, culprits of this is if you have a printer jam and a laser printer, you go and you just rip the page out. If you do not get every piece of that little paper, one, you're gonna have significantly more paper jams Two, it can cause issues with the images. All right. <laughs> the page has a gray background on it. The image drum itself is worn out. It's not creating such a difference in the charging, causing more toner to adhere to it, and it will need to be replaced. Yes, Karen. Why are these printers notorious for those paper jams? I mean, that's like the number one thing you find in, Be in these printers, these paper jams. If you stick your hand in there and oh my gosh, it's, it's crazy. Yes. And, and thank, I mean, they've gotten a lot better with, you know, let like one letting you know which door, like, cause they have like 10 doors on these laser printers and be like, it's behind door number three and you get to open it up. And then, you, you know, you can go right to that one place to pull the, pull the jam out. So, I mean, they, they are improving the technology, but the thing is, is the, is the calibration is so sensitive on some of this stuff that any type of dust or dirt or sand or whatever can jam things up to where it can't pass properly through and cause it to crumple up. So like, you know, it's just, it's a lot of it comes down to the cleaning and the maintaining of it. The less that's done, the more problems you're going to have. You know, as the rollers wear out, they're not going to, they're not going to push things through evenly. So one roller may have worn out more than the other on the same wheel. And so when it pushes through it, it goes off by just a slight bit. And then it causes that nice little accordion effect and 
backs up all the paper. So it's just unfortunate. The Achilles heel of printers is the, the, the dreaded paper jam. Um, <laughs> uh, ghost images that also fall. That's it's kind of it's the same thing as like a ghost image on your TV where you have like the secondary image. A ghost image on a paper would be like an image of a previous document that was printed. It means there's likely something wrong going on wrong with the, the cleaning process with it, like the cleaning bulb or the light may not be working properly. The drum itself may not be uh, clearing the charges properly. So it's holding on to those images from the previous one. And it also could be the cleaning blade is not cleaning everything off. So there's a couple different things that could go on here. No. Um, Here's a fun one for you. Have you ever had it on a printer or on a printer where you have the exact same smudge that happens? Like an interval is going down a page. So it's the, you know, we're going to imagine that all of these look exactly alike. So you know, we're going you know, to pretend for a minute. So you have the exact, and, and they're equally spaced. So uh, you have the same smudge that keeps happening over and over and over and over again. And it just, it, but it's happening at the exact same interval. Well, here's something really cool. Huh? I said, yes. What okay. is that? Asking that means, for a friend, Kelly. Asking you're asking, for, a asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. Moment of silence. All right. So when uh when you have that repeated smudge happening it is uh, a dirty roller essentially you have you have ink or debris on a roller here's the cool thing when they built the printers they built all the rollers at a different diameter so every single roller in the printer is different so on the manufacturer's website, you can actually measure the distance between the two smudges you have, and they'll say it's roller 10. So you don't need to disassemble the entire printer looking for one dirty roller. Based upon the difference in the smudges, you can actually know exactly which roller is dirty. So you can go straight to that roller and clean that one roller, and you can move on with your day. So neat little things that we wouldn't have thought of, but somehow the engineers did. Probably because they got tired of people calling them saying, hey, one of these rollers are dirty, come clean it. And they had to disassemble the entire printer to figure it out. But yes, ghost images, usually a problem with the image drum itself. Gray background, also the image drum is worn out and needs replacing. All right, other problems that you might run into with a laser printer, blank pages or out of toner. <laughs> it needs more toner. If you're getting blank pages out of a, out of a inkjet, it's out of ink. So simple, easy fix, out of toner, try diagnostic print. If not, check the power supply. Although if it's pushing pages through, something's going okay. Um, but typically out of toner. Uh, dirty printer printouts, like you get it out and it's like, you know, it's like smearing and smudging and it just, you know, it doesn't look good. Uh, well, it means it wasn't done cooking yet. So two things can be the problem with this. It could be the fuser itself is going bad because it's not reading the prop, reaching the proper temperature to bake uh, that resin into the paper. Or as Susan is pointing it out, you're using the wrong type of paper. So if you're using standard office paper and you're printing through, that's fine, but if you use like that real fancy, thick parchment paper, like you would for a resume or something like that, and you push that through, the fuser is going to have to get to a higher temperature in order to cook that toner into it. So the standard setting that it's currently set on 
for the average everyday paper is not going to be sufficient for the thicker weighted paper. So that's why it's important to, you know, essentially you can input the type of printer paper you're using in your printer. So it's either a bad fuser or not the paper, not the right paper, in which case either you change the settings on the paper so that it will adjust the temperature on the fuser or the fuser itself may need to be replaced. If the fuser needs to be replaced, you call the technician, you do not do yourself. We don't play with the fuser. All right, ghosting images. So the image on the drum isn't fully discharged. So it's either in the lamp or the drum. More often it's the drum. Um, it's not fully discharged. So it's holding on to that image of the previous document and recycling it back out through the printer. Um, so turn it off, allow some time to cool it down or lower the resolution or print in landscape orientation and see if that cleans things up. Vertical white lines. The toner is clogged. So there's like little, you know, clumps of toner building up. So take it out, rock it back and forth, kind of help break things up, reinstall the toner. See if that works. If not, you change it because also it could be a damaged cleaning blade and that cleaning blade is inside the toner cartridge itself. So when you replace the toner cartridge, that stuff gets cleaned up. Blotchy prints. Some of it's darker, some of it's lighter, it means you're getting low on toner and it's unevenly distributed. Take it out rock it back and forth, put it back in, should work for a little while. Other than that, you can check your fusing rollers and the drum for foreign objects to see if there is debris on that fusing roller, it won't be able to press down evenly. It'll be slightly spaced off so that heat won't get there. So some of it will smear, some of it will cook in okay. So dust and debris, incomplete characters, Adjust, adjust the print printer density in your printer settings. Creased pages. Restart your printer and try a different paper type because not all paper is created equal. Not all printers like all types of paper. Sometimes that bargain ream of paper is not the bargain you thought. Paper jams, restart the printer, follow the steps from the manufacturer to remove the paper, and please, please, please make sure you get all of the paper out. I don't care if it's a little one centimeter square. If that's all you have left is that one centimeter square, that will plague you for the rest of your days until you get it out. And pulling multiple sheets, Typically, this is an overloaded paper tray, like, you know, like, yeah, I can get the last of this ream in there, and you just ram it down in there, and you shove it in, and it's got too much uh, pressure up against the rollers, and then the rollers are picking up too many sheets of paper. The other thing could be worn out rollers, where it's grabbing too many at a time. And then finally, humidity, especially in Florida. Too much humidity, stuff starts to stick together. It'll grab multiple sheets at a time. Poor print quality in inkjet and impact printers. One, check your paper type. Make sure it is set properly. <clears throat> check your ink levels. Although they're really good about telling you, hey, you need to go out and buy a new cartridge. Uh, remove and reinstall the cartridge because that'll run it through a cycle where it'll uh, clean and, and recalibrate. Follow the printer's documentation to clean the nozzles and clean the sponge near the carriage rest to make sure it doesn't have a bunch of like goop, you know, like 
over time, you know, too much ink and stuff like that is on there. You need to clean it off. It's it kind of greasy or slimy. Uh, clean that off. And in that, in the process, re-moistens the sponge so that it can clean a little better too. Uh, port print quality for impact printers. Check and make sure that the ribbon is still good. It may need to be just advanced. Uh, the ribbon may need to be replaced. So that'd be one of the first things you check. Check the print head itself for dirt and debris. Because like we said, most impact printers are in manufacturing, automotive, and warehouse situations where you have a lot of all of the above. Uh, spacing on the print head might need to be adjusted as well. Is it close enough to where the pistons when they're firing are actually making solid impact with the page or are they set back a little bit too far to where it's barely touching the page so you only get like gray images. And sometimes that could be change over the course of the, the page where it starts out light but gets darker as it moves across because one side is set closer than the other. So it's getting a clearer image on one side than the other. Questions so far? Go ahead, pause here.